if Pete ruled the world, what investments, <laughs> what investments would we be making? And then how do you convince people to make them? This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back to another edition of our Incentives and Instincts series. I'm joined again today by Bryce Ward. Bryce, how are you doing today? I'm good. I listened to your new venture, Fireline, and I want to make sure all of our listeners go and listen to it. It's very well done, so congratulations. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. It's been a uh, really fun project. And uh, speaking of fun, the sun is shining. It's starting to feel a little bit like spring. So it's easy to forget that a couple short weeks ago, much of the country was in a deep freeze, and Texas in particular was in crisis as winter storm had rocked its power grid, leaving residents freezing without power, and lots of us wondering how, in a country like ours, could infrastructure fail so spectacularly? Is Texas unique? Could something like this happen in Montana? What's the state of affairs with our energy grid? So again, to think about this stuff, Bryce and I phoned a friend. Peter Larson is a staff scientist and deputy leader in the Electricity Markets and Policy Department at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Peter conducts research and analysis on the economics of electricity reliability and resilience. He's also an expert on the risk to infrastructure from extreme events. He holds a PhD in management science and engineering from Stanford, master's degrees from Stanford and Cornell, and he studied economics as an undergraduate right here at the University of Montana. Pete, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be here. So I guess, what, uh, you know, as a starting place, like when we see something like what happened in Texas, you know, we hear all about how their grid is, is is isolated from the rest of the country, but like, is what happened in Texas surprising? Is that, is that a surprising event from your vantage point? In some ways it is, uh, but in other ways it isn't. And I'll, I'll explain that. Um, it's surprising to me because a lot of our work at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, looks at reliability and resilience of the power system. And typically it's something like 95% of power outages occur at the distribution level. These are the power lines like you might see in your neighborhood. And in Texas, it was surprising because the power outage is actually caused way upstream from natural gas suppliers and then uh, both thermal and uh, renewable resources that were, were offline due to, the, to, due to the weather event. So that's surprising to me. It's not surprising that it happened because we know that there are underinvestments being made. Uh, well, there are investments that aren't being made in trying to make the systems more resilient to these 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 widespread long duration interruptions. And so, there's some surprising elements and some unsurprising elements with what happened in Texas. So, can we generalize that statement about you know underinvestment or, or lack of investment in infrastructure to to the rest of the country? Like, what's the state of affairs at a national level, and then? Maybe bring the lens to Montana in particular. How are things looking in Montana? So starting off at the, the national level, um, utilities have a really good and a, you know, a longstanding understanding of how to make the power system as reliable as possible. Um, there's no such thing as having a perfectly reliable system because that system would cost ungodly amounts of money. And so utilities make investments all the time. They go in front of regulators and, and seek cost recovery on investments to, you know, deal with reliability issues. And we think of these as like blue sky reliability. Yeah, there's a storm. Uh, how fast can you get the system back? Where it becomes a challenge is when you try to address the issues that come with, with big natural disasters uh, like hurricanes and, and wildfires. And those types of investments, we can we call those investments in resilience, and those tend to be much more costly. You know, undergrounding big sections of the power system, moving substations from you know flooding and inundation. These are big ticket costs 
And so utilities have a hard time justifying those investments in front of regulators. So that's what's going on nationally. In Montana, uh, Montana has had, you know, the great fortune of, of frankly having a pretty reliable power system and relatively inexpensive electricity rates. But we're, you know, I did a little bit of research before before this call, and you know, there are some some changes in in reliability uh, across Montana, and so that suggests that potential additional investments need to be made uh, to ensure that the system is reliable and resilient. But also, uh, starting to understand what happens if you don't make those investments, and so that's kind of the state of play in Montana at a very high level. So yeah, Peter's correct that. This is the basic challenge that we face whenever we're dealing with something that's an extreme event that's really bad when it happens. It's like, oh man, how does something like Texas happen? Is that, yeah, it's really costly to do all the work that you need to do to make sure that you avoid that. Because while we understand that these types of risks exist, and I think in the Texas case, I think the it was that you know, it wasn't actually that low of a probability risk, but some of the other risks that we face that are the big extreme events that we really do want electricity to operate during, uh, you know, they're, they're more low probability events. And, you know, as humans, we're bad, right? There's a small group of, of humans that are, you know, the preppers that are very like risk averse and aware of these risks and want to do everything that you can to avoid them. But for the most part, you know, then there's another group of people that are just kind of risk averse and maybe don't know that the risk exists. And then there's lots of other people who are kind of like, ah, it's not going to happen. I don't need to worry about it. And a lot of times they turn out to be right. So before I moved to Montana, I was on this thing called the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Commission. And while I was on the commission, we wrote the thing called the Oregon Resilience Plan, which is basically like, you know, yesterday, uh, when we recorded this anyway, was the 10-year anniversary of the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And, you know, our job in Oregon was basically to convince Oregonians that that exact event is going to happen in Oregon at some point. We just don't know when. And unlike Japan, where they know that that kind of event is likely and have prepared for it, Oregon, at least at the time, uh, 10 years ago, was very unprepared for it. And that's basically the same kind of issue that we face kind of across our infrastructure is we kind of know these low probability events are, are out there. But there's kind of this, well, is it worth it to invest and 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 try and make it so that you know when the event happens, you know we're prepared. And so, kind of getting that cost benefit analysis right is really hard. Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. That's kind of what your job is: is trying to help us do a better job of doing that cost benefit analysis. That's exactly right. And a lot of the earlier part of my career, you know, I focused on costs of infrastructure, let us study on, you know, the costs of climate change on Alaska's infrastructure. That was one of my really early big pieces on the subject. But lately, all of my work in this power system resilient economic space is really trying to get at quantifying the benefits of making investments. And it turns out that <laughs> relative to everything else, as they cost are easy, the benefits of making an investment are much more challenging to understand. And so that's a lot of our work is trying to put an economic impact on past and future power outages. And then if you make the investment, showing that that's an avoided economic impact or a benefit. And so that's where a lot of my work is these days on the benefit side of the equation. So how large are the benefits? Well, it depends. Some of the benefits can be insanely large, billions and billions of dollars. If you were able to avoid, let's say that Texas, let's go through a little thought exercise. If Texas had fully winterized their power system to be able to withstand cold temperatures, meaning spending investments in or making investments in natural gas suppliers and distribution, winterizing the thermal power plants, the natural gas facilities, so their valves didn't freeze up. Um, dealing with some of the renewable issues, and there were some, but those were overhyped in, in some corners of the media. You make those investments, that's expensive. 
But if you avoid a power outage that impacts 5 million people for a week, you know, you're talking tens of billions of dollars. And, you know, we develop tools. Uh, we have sort of tools in our toolkit to try to get at some of those benefits. What's fun about talking about this is this is the frontier, at least in energy economics, is how do you estimate the economic impacts of power outages? And there are also other benefits that economists sometimes put values on, like avoiding lost life, uh, you know, the value of avoiding pollution. And, and so there are all these other benefits swirling around out there, but we're really zeroed in on the economics of what happens when the, when the lights go out. So how many events like Texas do you guys even have to study? It yeah. was so, it's kind of, I think it was so shocking to most of us because the notion that like a large state could be without power during the cold part of the year uh, for a prolonged period was, I, you know, it was kind of unimaginable, I guess. Well, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. So I'm going to go off on a little side, a little tangent here. I, one thing I've been reflecting on since, you know, a couple of weeks ago when this happened in Texas was it was right at the same time that, you know, we sent a, a spacecraft a hundred million miles, you know, <laughs> to, to the, to Mars. We dropped a rover, and, and watching that video was just, you know, mind mind bending. Dropped the rover literally on a dime, and at the same time, you have one of the most prosperous states in the country, in arguably the most prosperous country in the world. And you had five million people without power, boiling drinking water. That to me was, when I reflect, that was the most stunning irony of the timing of, of what happened in Texas. Well, here, let me just add to that. Yeah. We're also simultaneously ramping up the, va- uh, the distribution of a vaccine that we developed in a year to an entirely novel disease. Like it's, it's mind bending. Yeah. Yeah. There are all these ironies and it, it's, it's, it was a, obviously a big tragedy for the people that went through that in Texas. Um, you asked a question a bit ago about how many how many examples do we have to study of, of big power outages. By the way, this wasn't the biggest power outage in history, but it was certainly very big. And we we just published a, a study, I guess, about a, a literally the during the middle of the power outage in Texas, we published a pair of studies <laughs> right at the same time, talking about the economics of big wide widespread power outages. And one of those studies was a case study analysis of six different locations across the country that have faced natural disasters and what happened with the power outage and how utilities started to assess that damage. And so we do have some historic precedent to study past power outages, but we don't have enough. And we don't have enough of uh, insights from how customers behaved before, during, and after the outage to really calibrate what we call regional economic models to study the full economic impact of those types of outages. So it, it might be useful at this point, Pete, to talk a little bit about what a public utility is. I mean, as you're sort of laying this out there, your work in kind of forecasting the benefits or the avoided costs of a catastrophic failure or natural disaster I mean, human beings are not so good at sort of just cognitively grasping those probabilities and making sound decisions based on them. You know, if you were to put it to voters right after a natural disaster, you'd probably get a lot of support for investments. A few months later, they forget about it and they're not going to want to pay for what feels like a low probability event. Does that where a public utility fits in? It can kind of bridge this public-private if we let only market forces dictate um, investments. You're not going to have facilities in a lot of places. Like, how does how does that come into play? Yeah, so maybe I'll start by just describing at, at a very high level the difference between a public and a private utility. That'd Please, be helpful. yeah. So private utilities, we typically, at least in in my line of work, we we refer to them as IOUs or investor-owned utilities. And uh, Northwestern is an example. Northwestern provides the most most of power for Montana, but not all. They typically report to shareholders. In many parts of the country, they have regulated electricity rates where they have to go in front of regulators and justify their costs. And then 
the regulator gives them a, a rate of return on their investments. It's a, usually a fixed percentage above their costs. And that's kind um, of in exchange for their monopoly power in a region? Is that kind of the trade-off there? That's right. Okay. So that's a, a private utility, and there's you know a lot of variety in in how different you know regulatory agencies deal with their utilities and the re- rates of return that they allow uh, the utility to earn. In a public utility, there are a couple of different kinds. There are cooperatives, co-ops. That's uh, you know basically a group of citizens who collectively own a utility. Uh, there are municipally run utilities. These are, you know, local or city governments that may run a utility. And then there are the federal power programs. This is sometimes referred to as power, the Power Marketing Administration. This is Department of Energy uh, controlled uh, entities that uh, basically deliver power to, in most cases, the muni, the muni and the co-op local utilities and these big power administrations are you know primarily hydroelectric resources uh, across the west in the central part of the country and they sell power at a at a pretty reasonable rate to the the munis and the co-ops and the co-ops to deliver that power uh, to their customers so that's the sort of general gist of public uh, power versus private utilities we haven't studied a lot on the topic of whether public versus privately run utilities have better reliability. We do have an ongoing partnership with the American Public Power Association to look at reliability and and the benefits of making investments in reliability. But we have never really studied, you know, do publicly run utilities perform better? Um, One thing I can say about public utilities and private utilities is it's not clear to me whether a public utility would be able to get or have access to the capital needed to make some of these bigger investments to avoid the big, big natural disaster type interruptions. How big are those investments? Well, these investments, you know, if you're talking about moving a substation because of flooding, you know, a big, big substations, these are 50 million, you know, 50 million plus type endeavors and, and taking down the old one and moving it to higher ground and then reconnecting all the, you know, the, the transformers and, and all the different components. That's a, that's a heavy undertaking for a little, you know, potentially a small, relatively small municipally run or, or a co-op. And so how are we thinking about these sorts of, or how are you thinking about these sorts of, you know, in investments and the need for them? And I'm sure there's like basic modeling of how, you know, the investments amortize over time, but, but in terms of re- resilience and the risks posed to these, um, to this infrastructure through, you know, more extreme and more frequently extreme weather events, how, how is, how is your group kind of conceptualizing those risks and are, are they changing? So we, I, I kind of think of us as a bit downstream. We certainly cite research uh, and review research that talks about how extreme weather is increasing in frequency and intensity. We then make assumptions uh, about how much reliability may get worse or resiliency may be worse if those trends continue. And then our neck of the woods is all around, okay, so if we can show that reliability is getting worse over time due to extreme weather or natural hazards, then what would be the economic impact of that? And so we do develop models, and I've developed models part of my dissertation looking at reliability trends over time, but it's very difficult to tease out what what portion of those trends are due to extreme weather versus lack of spending by the utilities versus the share of line miles that are underground. Um, And that's just primarily due to the fact that the data that we get from utilities on reliability performance over time is very, it's got what we call a a coarse 
spatial and temporal scale. And I was getting real wonky on you. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah, tell us more. Means, <laughs> it just means that we get annual reliability data, and it's usually for the whole service territory, not for a neighborhood. Okay. And when you have that, when you have that kind of data, it's very difficult to, to, to detect signals that are driving reliability. That makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, you, you talked about the, the course data and it makes me sort of think of supply and demand dynamics. I mean, one of the, the stories uh, you know, it was all over the newspapers after the Texas debacle was these people, you know, they endured boiling water in their homes to heat them and their families and so forth. And then they're hit with a $17,000 electric bill. It makes sense that there'd be, you know, surge pricing, if you will. I mean, we're trying to provide incentives to limit people's consumption of scarce resources. But at some point, something like $17,000 is ridiculous, right? So like, how, how does, how does, how do those things operate in, in energy markets? Um, both in terms of, you know, you can understand consumer demand, but the supply issues, interesting in terms of, you know, the different sources of energy, fossil fuels, renewables, hydro, hydro, whatever, like they have different dynamics in terms of when they can supply energy and in different forms, right? That's right. And, you know, that 17,000, I saw some of those articles in there. Yeah, I, I can only imagine getting a bill like that in the mail. I, what I do know is that in Texas, I say this <laughs> with some reason, but only a quarter of their residents were on that variable pricing scheme, basically meaning that the, the majority of Texas residents were on a fixed price uh, electricity rate structure, but there still were a quarter, a quarter of the residents that were basically um, broadside to what happened in Texas in terms of electricity prices. And then was that an opt-in thing? Did people opt in thinking they could game the system for a lower rate and then they just got pinched or how did that work? I don't know whether it was opt-in or opt-out. Um, what I do know is that, you know, Texas has historically had fairly low electricity rates and, you know, people looked at what their fixed rate would be and what the historical average electricity rate was and said, I'm going to roll the dice. Maybe they didn't think about it like that, but the dice, you know, landed in a very unfavorable way um, for, for those customers. The thinking in Texas, and I'm, I, I wouldn't call myself uh, an expert in market design of Texas, and Texas is unique. It's in some ways kind of an island. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Raging wildfires have scorched a record number of the acres and killed at least 31 people. continues to climb from those people. devastating wildfires. Last year, wildfires scorched a landmass nearly five times the size of Yellowstone National Park. It was the largest area burned since reliable records began. Fires are getting bigger and hotter and more devastating than ever before. But what all that fire means and what to do about it depends on who you ask. The experience of a forest taking fire is really something. It's not only a gift to us, but it's more, more of a gift to the land. There will always be fear of fire, I, I know that, and I don't pretend there won't be, but in certain situations, there shouldn't be. I'm Justin Angle, and for the last couple years, I've been talking to scientists, historians, and firefighters themselves to hear their stories. You owe it to the guys that died. I wanted to figure out, how did we get here? We're going to knock fire out of the landscape. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. It was a crazy ambition. And where do we go? It just, knowledge is, is freaking power. I'll talk about it in a calm way, but this is me hitting the panic button. Am I making any difference here with the science? <laughs> That's what I wonder sometimes. This is Fireline, a six-part podcast series from Montana Public Radio and the University of Montana College of Business about what wildfire means for the West, our planet, and our way of life.
Hey, this is Mark Moss from Tell Us Something, and you're listening to A New Angle. You allow, you have these high prices, and if the high prices show up, that you're incentivizing producers to show up and deliver power. And by having, you know, price signals um, that are, you know, when you have $9,000 a megawatt hour for an amount of time, the thinking is that every independent power producer is going to rush and get try to get their power to the places in Texas that were showing some of those prices. The problem was that those power producers weren't out there because their capacity was down due to the cold weather. And then furthermore, places bordering Texas were also having their own challenges with power, getting power produced and delivered. And Texas is a you know, as a state electricity system, you know, it's, they've always counted on Texas power plants delivering power to Texans. And in this situation, they really needed places from outside to get power to Texans. And so there were some, some problems with the import of electricity, in addition to just these other places having their own challenges with the weather. Yeah, that movement of elect, like storing and movement of electricity, those are two difficult, well, somewhat difficult things to do, depending on the type of, of energy, right? And how you're connected to a grid. That's exactly right. And this is one of the things that um, is sometimes difficult to explain to people because everybody, I think most people think renewable energy is pretty cool. And for a lot of different reasons, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, uh, the obviously the environmental uh, stuff. But you got to get that power from from somewhere to somewhere else. And it turns out that um, if you're talking about utility scale renewables, you know, siting and building transmission lines is is not an easy undertaking, and especially if it crosses state, you know, state lines. Like what's the role of like high capacity batteries? And you hear you hear, you hear Elon Musk and others like speculating in those areas about the importance of being able to build storage capacity. What role? You know, how does storage work in energy markets? And and how do you build infrastructure there? So I have to tell you, I think one of the coolest things that's coming down the pike is these these big uh, storage technologies. Uh, I'm not an expert in you know lithium ion batteries and, and some of the amazing work that people are doing, but that for your listeners is something to keep a close eye on. Both as, you know, someone that might be interested in just clean energy and, and reliable energy, but also if you're an investor, I'd be looking very closely at what's happening in the storage space. Uh, maybe connecting it back to Montana. Whenever we talk about storage, uh, it's important to me mention that there's other types of storage besides batteries. And uh, I recently became aware of uh, this project outside Martinsdale called the Gordon Butte uh, Pumped Storage Facility. Have either of you heard about this project? A little bit. Yeah. As far as I can tell, it's an independent power producer. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of wind turbines up outside Martinsdale. And they're basically building two reservoirs one that's low and then one that's higher up, higher elevation. And they're installing essentially a pump storage facility that will, it's a, it's a big battery in a way. It's pumping water from the lower reservoir up to the upper reservoir. And then whenever the system needs to be balanced because renewables are intermittent and they, they have you know, some challenges hooking into the grid, they can release the water basically like a hydro hydro unit and they can provide um, power both capacity but also uh, what we call you know voltage support um, and so it's a 400 megawatt project so it's a big big project that's an example of a battery but on a grand scale and, and that project which is under development i mean that's the kind of stuff that's happening in montana that i just love i mean i love seeing stuff like that so, you know, as you describe that, that just seems like an awesome idea. At the same time, that also sounds like the sort of idea that's like a punchline in a presidential debate. Like, how does, how does an idea, like, that's a bold idea. How do, how do infrastructure projects at that level kind of, 
come to pass? Because we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars. Who's going to make that investment? How are they going to kind of pay for it over time? How do they kind of come off the ground? That's a great question. I believe that that specific project outside Martinsdale is um, is being funded by by private private equity or private investment firms. Mm-hmm. There's a an investment fund based in Denmark that's that's uh, you know contributing to the development of that. But yeah, these are these are large scale projects. But if we envision a world where we have more and more renewables coming online, you need you need power plants like that one to keep the system stable, the power system stable. And, um, you know, that's why you see, whenever you see a lot of, you know, renewables coming online, you'll often see natural gas, typically peaking natural gas units. These are combustion turbines. They're basically jet engines on the ground. Um, you see those show up not far from renewables and it's, they have sort of a, coexistence together in, in many cases. So that's why the the, black, the Gordon View project is really interesting because it's essentially a renewable resource that's supporting other renewable resources. Sure. So Okay. So like draw that out a little bit with those, um, you know, natural gas turbines. So, you know, the thing with renewables is that, you know, that's like the wind turbines only turn when the wind's blowing and the solar panels only generate electricity when the sun is shining. So, you know, there's gaps in supply. So you, you got to either store it or you got to figure out a more steady supply. So those gas turbines, natural gas turbines kind of fill the gaps. Is that, is that kind of what's happening? Yep. That's exactly right. They're often, a lot of times they're called combined cycle combustion turbines, but Often you hear of their simple cycle combustion turbines, and these are fast start units. They can, I mean, it's like driving up, you know, a Ferrari. They can kick these things on instantly. So if there's an imbalance in the frequency or the voltage on the system because renewables are over generating or under generating because maybe the wind's blowing too much or not enough, then these natural gas fired power plants kick on instantaneously and sure. balance the system. Yeah, like the uh, gas-powered motor in a Prius, it sounds like, in some ways. Exactly. Right? Very, very similar concept. So how, how does it work kind of at the, you know, the, at the consumer level? You know, demand for electricity fluctuates through some natural cycles, but we also, you know, I, I guess there's a societal interest, um, at least through conservationists, to get people to use less electricity, to be more thoughtful about at least the use of fossil fuels. How is kind of energy conservation, uh, do you think about how policy in that space can come to pass given this complex structure of how energy is generated and stored and delivered? Yeah, and I, my, I got my start at Berkeley Lab uh, conducting research into U.S. energy efficiency issues. Berkeley Lab has a long history of studying you know, energy conservation issues. Uh, they call him the godfather of energy efficiency was a, was a very famous scientist named Art Rosenfeld. And he was a student, I can't remember if it was Fermi or, or who, but somebody at the University of Chicago, a very famous physicist. And Rosenfeld was the one who coined the term megawatt, meaning a negative megawatt. And I happen to believe very strongly that energy efficiency and demand response they're not sexy they're you know from a from a policy perspective they always kind of get short um short changed but we have shown at berkeley lab and, and other places that conserving you know a megawatt hour of electricity is cheaper than producing an additional megawatt hour of electricity and so, you know, energy efficiency and demand response need to be at the table in all these discussions. And frankly, you know, when you talk about power system reliability and resilience, if there had been more energy efficiency in places like Texas and potentially the, the ability to respond to demand in real time, the power outages may not have been as pronounced as they, they were. So what's the low-hanging fruit in terms of energy efficiency? <laughs> 
we kind of think about things in terms of households and businesses, the low hanging fruit that has been picked quite a bit is lighting, um, having uh, LED lights, uh, low low energy use lighting. Uh, those things, I typically focus on the building side or I focus on that sector in my energy efficiency work. You know, ESCOs, these energy services companies that come in and retrofit old buildings, the first thing they go after is lighting. And then it gets more complicated after that. Uh, kind of going back to um, you know, the economic benefits of resilience, can you make it a little bit more concrete or descriptive to the listeners in terms of what are we talking about when we say that there are billions of dollars of benefits to avoiding something like the Texas disaster? What, where are those benefits coming from and how do we know that they're real? Okay. So we start by calling the benefits avoided costs. So these are costs that would not have occurred had you made an investment in power system reliability or resilience. And so some of those avoided costs for a household could be not having your pipes freeze and damaging, you know, all the ceilings and walls in your house. That's a huge cost. Yeah, those pictures of like the fans with that had like, you know, the water is pouring off and it's frozen inside your yeah. house. <laughs> But those were very, uh, you know, terrifying. Yeah, that's a very iconic photo. That ceiling fan, that ceiling fan shot. Um, so that's a, a, you know, damage to your home because the power outage occurred. Uh, there's also food spoilage, uh, inconvenience costs. You're having to drive across town to go get food with your neighbor or whatever. Um, that's, that's on the household side. On the business side, it's complicated. So the way I explain it to more general audiences is as follows. Let's say that there's an automobile manufacturer in Texas and they're without power and they're without power for a week. They have lost revenue because they're not able to produce automobiles. That would be considered a direct cost. They also have potentially some damage just like the household had you know, to their, their plant, whether it's freezing pipes or machinery that needed power and now is, you know, overheated or something's happened. So they have direct costs uh, and there are ways to measure that. We refer to this other category of impacts and we call these indirect impacts. And so let's say that this, this automobile manufacturer has no power, but upstream its supplier, maybe it's Michelin tires, they had power, but Michelin can't ship the tires to the automobile manufacturer because they're without power. That means that Michelin upstream faces an economic impact. Same on the same side, downstream customers of the automobile manufacturer can also be impacted whether they have power or not. They're not able to get that pickup truck they needed for their business uh, when they needed it. And so if you can make an investment in power system reliability or resilience and avoid some of those impacts, it doesn't take a huge mental leap to realize those numbers get big real quick. Is it nonlinear? Like, you know, is it like, yeah, we can do without power for a day or two. And then is there an inflection point at which it kind of just explodes or is it kind of relatively linear? Uh, this is a good, all right, now we're getting into my terms. These are long, I love wonky questions. So uh, <laughs> the, the way I think about it, if, if I was to like describe the shape of the impacts, I think they're like an S, they're an S shape. And with, on the, for, for you math nerds out there, and I know you're, you're out there, on the X axis, it's duration of the power outage. And on the Y axis, it's dollar damage or dollar impacts. It's more of an S shape. It goes up real quick and then it starts to, to, to level off and potentially come down if businesses just relocate away permanently. Yeah. So I believe the impacts, we believe the impacts have more of an S shape than a pure exponential shape. Back to my earthquake experience, right? The, you know, the, the, the terrifying scenario in the Cascadia subjection zone earthquake is you could be without power for months and yeah, the, the terrifying scenario is, well, at what point do businesses just say, well, this is not a place I want to be anymore? 
uh, and they just are people and they just leave. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the long-term effects of the Texas event are. I'm very curious to see, you know, is there migration? Is there, you know, is this something that people are going to have forgotten about in a month? Uh, or is this actually changing investment and location decisions for at least some time horizon? You know, and it hit at a time when Texas was getting a ton of in-migration, you know, notably from California and other folks trying to, you know, for whatever reason, avoid taxes or get more favorable regulatory environments or whatever. Um, so, yeah, does something like this just draw salience to, you know, avoiding some of those taxes and dealing with lower levels of regulation? And this might be a lazy argument, but it might come with the cost of some of these um, infrastructure failures coming to bear. That's right. And and how much is someone willing, like if you're a small business, how much are you willing to take before you really think seriously about, you know, making your business energy efficient, putting on some solar and potentially putting in a backup generator? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's a, those are decisions and that are being discussed, not in just Texas, but I mean, California is another one, right? The wildfire situation in California is ongoing and catastrophic there's no you know there we haven't heard any stories that this situation these public safety power shutoffs are going to stop anytime soon they're going to keep doing this until we get to a point where they you know make some major translate you know transformational changes in their in their systems there pete with your work like you know how do you how do you make the case to policymakers or do you make the case to policymakers? I mean, politicians and people who make policy got to, got to decide if these investment happen, ultimately taxpayers and voters, I suppose have some input as well, but like, you know, the, the, this isn't like a, it's like buying insurance, right? Nobody wants to buy right. insurance. <laughs> um, no politician. Uh, although maybe now, like we're in a we're in a climate where investing in infrastructure is maybe thought to be a little bit more favorable. Like, how does that interface work with making this case for these benefits that are actually avoided costs? Uh, how do you convince people? Well, let me piggyback on that. What do you? What, what's your dream scenario? Right. Like, what? What if if Pete ruled the world? <laughs> what investments what investments would we be making and then how do you convince people to make them well let's just start here if pete were all the world i'd be fishing and, and hunting and playing golf the rest <laughs> well that's why you came and, back to montana you know, of course right, we understand right, right. that <laughs> but i'm saying full time full time no in all seriousness <laughs> i i i like to think about it and 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 i think you know obviously both of you have, have have a lot of history conducting research in business and economics. And I always think about it like um, having resilient power is a public good. And what I mean by that for the non-economics folks out there is that there are bystanders that get benefits from these investments. There are, you know, the direct people involved in the decision are the utility and its customer. But if you have a power system that can withstand anything, you've got national security benefits, you've got all these, you know, all these big things that are what I would consider more public good type quality. And what we know from economics is that with public goods, you got to incentivize them. And so the way I've been thinking about it is, if you're going to make some huge investment in your power system, that at face value, all the ratepayers are going to, you know, riot over because of the cost of the electricity quadruple or whatever it is. You know, maybe you break up and you, you have state, local, and federal government contribute to the cost. And then you have ratepayers contributing to the cost. And so if there is some major investment that needs to be made, that it's a mix of public and private funding. And how you allocate, how you come up with that, what share, who pays for what, is an open, an open and interesting research question. But if I rule the world, uh, and I, I hope I never have to do that, um, I, I would develop a business model that ratepayers and and private sector folks 
cover a portion of the cost and then state, local, and federal government contribute the remainder. And then you'll get these investments made that wouldn't have been made otherwise by the utility or the ratepayers by themselves. Are there any good models for that? Is that happening anywhere or any states or municipalities or organizations doing that well? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm certain there are plenty of examples of it, whether they're doing it well or not. Right. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Well, yeah. And you don't know if you've done it well for 50 years. Right. Right. And that's Until kind it's of the problem. Right. Yeah. And then how do you measure something that never happened because you made an investment? It's that back to that insurance point you made a second ago. Indeed. Well, Pete, I got to say, when uh, you take over ruling the world, I hope you invite uh, me and Bryce to your tea time. Um, <laughs> yeah, this has been fantastic. I uh, learned a ton. As we close, how can people learn about you and your research and your work online? Yeah, thanks. Well, first off, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's a real honor to be part of the, the podcast. And then it's also an honor to to be able to be on here as a University of Montana alumni. So that's a, that's a really big deal to me. My time in Missoula was some of the best times of my life. So I'm really happy to be part of this. Uh, you can find out more about me uh, by just going to Google and type in Peter Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N, Berkeley Lab. And it'll direct you right to uh, the research I do at, at Berkeley Lab. And uh, you'll see probably a lot of other research done by my colleagues who frankly know a lot more about some of these topics than I do. Well, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, gosh, I hope these sorts of events never happen here, but I hope people who are listening and, and can make decisions about it um, will be more thoughtful about the risks of these sorts of things and the investments we all might consider to, uh, to avoid them. Pete, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift of UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business, with additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors and Drum Coffee. AJ Williams is our producer, VTO Jeff Ament and John Wicks made our music, and Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. If you liked what you heard, tell your friends about it. Thanks a lot. See you next time.